Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning again and welcome to our March um, DDA Rate Review Advisory Group meeting. Um, we've got a pretty packed agenda today, but before we get started, I um, want to introduce our special guest for this morning, our secretary, Dr. Laura Herrera-Scott, um, to deliver some opening remarks. Morning, everyone. Um, uh, one, I'm excited to be here today to um, witness, you know, what you guys have been going through at least for um, last year. And I think this is the second month of this process, but I wa wanted to thank you all. I know this is um, time outside of your normal um, jobs and appreciate your commitment to helping us um, ensure that the process that we have in place is open and transparent as we figure out um, the appropriate rates. Um, I know it convened last year for the first time, and you all know we're here to develop adequate and sustainable rates, and I think some progress has been made all along those lines, and specifically, at least in my understanding, calling out um, the transportation component last year and the meaningful day services that proposed an increase and, and that change was part of the governor's FY24 budget request and is estimated to result in an additional $10 million in payments. So looking forward to the work this year, especially as we move um, from PCIS2 to LTSS. And I know there's still ongoing work that needs to happen with the meaningful day. I think um, it was brought up during the budget testimony as well um, earlier uh, uh, this month or late last month. Um, but I appreciate your commitment and dedication to the process um, as we continue to support the work and I'm here um, just because I want to be a partner with all of you to make sure we get this process done right. Um, with that, I'll just turn it over to you all. And thank you for letting me uh, participate today. Thank, thank you. you for, um, all right, why don't we move to the next slide and get into our agenda. Uh, we're going to start with approval of the February meeting minutes, um, status updates from some February meeting action items, um, an update from Hilltop on the general ledger um, data collection process, um, and then we will dive into some of our FY25 great review priorities. Um, and then we'll, of course, have some uh, open discussion time before we close with our next steps. Um, including talking about what you can expect for our next meeting in April. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, as a reminder, this advisory group is part of the structure implemented to further MDH's commitment to the development of adequate and sustainable rates that promote the vision and mission of the DBA. The commitment members have made to participate ensures an open and transparent process to review rates. Next slide, please. Uh, members were sent an email with meeting minutes on March 8th. As chair, I will make a motion to approve the minutes. Um, would a member like to second? This is Chris, I'll second the minutes. Right. Any discussion on the minutes? All right, then all in favor of approving the minutes. Aye. 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 Anyone? Anyone opposed? Okay, then I'm now going to turn it over to Robert for some policy updates. Thank you, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have a few updates related to the FY 2024 uh, rate table and the Employment First Work Group. First, uh, we, we get that <clears throat> um, once the budget has been officially approved, the plan is to update the FY 2024 rate table 
which would include the changes um, that Secretary Herrera Scott mentioned earlier relate to the transportation components, as well as the application of the additional, um, uh, um, the, the COLA, the mandated COLA. As for the Employment First Work Group, draft questions have been sent to the work group for review. A draft survey has been sent as well for review, as well as uh, any policy updates as a result that will be shared with the RAG group. So before I turn it over to Jennifer to talk about the status of the action items from our February meeting, are there any questions? Great, Jennifer? Oh, Robert, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having some technology issues, unfortunately on my end, it's Laura. Um, I think my only question, tell me if I missed this somewhere, but of what the um, percent rate increase is projected to be based on um, assuming that the General Assembly passes the uh, FY24 budget as it was introduced? Sure. So without being able to comment on where we are with the accelerated colas because as i understand there's still some discussion around that uh july one the four percent and when i mean what i mean is the timing uh but with the uh, mandated four percent cola uh that would go in effect july one uh we also requested additional uh an additional uh two percent to apply to the the funding rate as well and then the um changes to the transportation component will also be part of that new rate table. All contingent on passage by the General Assembly, of course. And then right. we'll get that out as soon as possible. Okay, I guess I was just curious more about the impact, particularly on Meaningful Day. And I, I thought um, that there was potentially some discussion around that $20 million that's in addition to the 12 percent essentially really being used to target the meaningful day rates given how you know we sort of acknowledge that they're all significantly or most of them are significantly under where they need to be yeah, that's correct laura the uh additional uh percentage that we requested to to move up to bump up the funding percentage uh would be applied to the meaningful day rates Okay, great, thank yep. you. Sorry, Jennifer? Sure, um, why don't we move to the next slide, please? All right. So we wanted to provide you with um, this list of status update from the February meeting. Um, we had a request to compile a list of past data collected and available um, and applicable to review this rate cycle, um, including the relevant data on group sizes shared last rate review cycle. Um, and this will this information will be shared by Optimus during um, the FY25 rate review priority discussion today. Um, there's a request to share the updated data collection rubric um, that will also be shared today. Um, and um, another request was to offer clarity on expectations around members working in between the RREG monthly meeting. Um, we consulted with um, our AAG to make sure that um, we set some guidelines that were within um, the Open Meetings Act. So. Members may meet to advance work outside of RAG meetings, but cannot have a quorum of members and cannot replicate the work of the RAG. Um, requests to present work to the RAG should be submitted at least two weeks prior to the next meeting, and you can send that request um, to the RAG email that you see up on the screen. Um, our next status update. Uh, the general ledger data collection tool was distributed to members by email on March 8th. 
um, the transportation adjustment from the last cycle that was shared at the August 2022 meeting was also distributed to members on March 8th. Any questions about the status updates? All right. In that case, I will turn it over to Kristen from the Hilltop Institute to give us a general ledger data collection update. I'm going to move to the next slide, please. Um, wonderful. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Kristen from Hilltop again. Just wanted to touch base again on the general ledger data collection um, and the template development. I know that during our last RAG meeting, there were some questions raised about the template draft and how um, the materials that were used historically to collect cost data were incorporated or consulted um, for the process. So we did want to share that the revised template that was shared with the group last week is a product of a engaged process. Um, over a year ago, Hilltop began reviewing materials from the previous general ledger collection process um, and started drafting a tool. Um, Hilltop had discussions internally to include our fiscal and rate setting um, subject matter experts. Um, and then we engaged in several conversations with Optimus to identify the type and level of detail needed in the data to inform a rate rebase process. Services were discussed and intentionally grouped to collect optimal service level data. Um, we had additional discussions surrounding the data on utilization, payments, and unique participants served. The process was iterative and draft revisions of the template were shared with both Optimus and the DBA for review and feedback. Last October, um, you'll remember that the draft template was shared with the RAG along with a link to a feedback survey to get initial thoughts, reactions, feedback, and suggestions on the tool. Um, Hilltop did receive um, and was appreciative of the feedback submitted by Max, and we were able to incorporate their requested edits to the tool prior to the start of the provider work group. From November through January, Hilltop engaged the 16 providers who volunteered for the general ledger provider work group. Um, the work group was instrumental um, in providing feedback on all aspects of the tool. And the ultimate goal was to have the providers who participate to actually complete and use the tool and provide targeted feedback um, on that experience. Um, several technical assistance calls were held to address questions um, and identify topics as provider reviewed the tool. <clears throat> and then we did receive um, tools from seven providers, um, seven um, groups submitted the template with data, and then five of those seven who submitted data also submitted us additional feedback. We took those tools that we got and the feedback. Um, we identified additional areas for um, more discussion. We talked with both the DDA on policy related items and Optimus on key areas of the feedback um, received, and the edits to that tool um, resulted in the draft that you guys received last week. Next slide, please. Um, and so the revised tool um, was shared with the RAG um, for another review and to solicit additional comments. Um, again, we're just really flagging that provider feedback is essential to finalizing the tool and establishing a standard data collection process. Um, we really see the RAG um, as being instrumental in sharing this draft template with your contacts, provider networks, fiscal staff, and stakeholder groups for review. Um, and then in addition to the feedback on the tool, the RA can also really be pivotal in helping to identify the technical assistance needs of the provider community to support the adoption of the tool and preparation required to start collecting data for fiscal 24. Um, so this means that providers would be able to start collecting data on July 1st um, of 23 to be able to report for fiscal 24. Um, the partnership and engagement of the RA to help finalize the draft template is essential um, for data collection needed for our work moving forward. Um, we, to, to date, um, we did share that tool um, as well as our email address to collect any direct feedback. We haven't received um, any feedback to date, 
Um, so I'm not sure if there are items that you guys wanted to discuss today um, or if you are, are looking to be able to share those comments with us by email. Kristen, it's Chris. I certainly think there was was expectation, at least from my perspective, to kind of get your presentation today and then potentially provide some additional feedback. Sure, of course. Um, and we're you know open to to getting that feedback. Um, if it would be helpful to schedule some time to have a quick call um, with our Hilltop team, we're happy to do that as well. Um, everyone had should have received a copy of the tool. I'm not sure if there were particular items you wanted to walk through or discuss today. Um, we can certainly pull it up. Um, I know there was a request to have it in advance, so it could be reviewed. This is Maria, Kristen. Um, I, I um, was part of Max's feedback um, last November, and I didn't. There, there was a number of things that Max did provide some feedback on, and I didn't see that incorporated. So. Um, I'm just, um, I, I do think it would be helpful to maybe walk through the tool and, and maybe explain kind of what, what you're trying to accomplish with the tool and, and uh, what it, what it does and doesn't, because there were some things like, um, you know, that we had suggested, um, for example, like the time period, um, I, it's isn't, um, laid out in the tool as far as what time period you're planning on collecting. Um, information around acuity, billable, non-billable time, and some of this is related to um, kind of you know the, the discussion I think later today. But um, we want to make sure that the tool aligns and supports uh, the rate setting process. And so I think there's some components in the tool that that may be missing or information that we're going to need um, that we just don't have. Um, and it'd be nice to think about you know if it's not in this version you know, how, how is this tool going to evolve to make sure it supports the rate setting going forward? Sure. Um, so let me go ahead and um, pull up the tool. Um, and I'm not sure. Or if our um, host can pull the tool up for me. Kristen, can yes. we can I share the screen with you and you project the presentation that you have? Sure. Okay. Okay. No, um, so, um, I apologies. I have several screens. Are you seeing the tool, or are you seeing something else? Something else. Different. <laughs> Can you tell me which one? It's on the okay. screen with your uh, appointment confirmation for RX. And your desktop. There you go. Okay, thank you so much. Give me one second here. Oh. Yep, I'm gonna. Apologies. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so the the first tab um, is the general led ledger template instructions. Um, and so Maria, to kind of address your point, the general ledger template is designed to collect data on a fiscal year basis. Um, and so that determination would be made, you know, by the DBA for the year they wanted to collect. Um, the current goal is to be able to start collecting data in fiscal 24. Um, so the provider network would align their systems to be able to collect the data in the way that would need to be reported um, or in a way that would be compatible um, so that when the ask for the fiscal 24 data comes in, providers would be able to complete the template um, and submit that back um, to the DBA. So, sorry, um, just to clarify, Kristen, so if the providers are asked to complete this in July 1 of this year, it would be fiscal 
too? Or is there flexibility around the time period that you're asking for? Or are you asking for data for a 12 month period in fiscal 22, for example? Yep. So the goal actually would be for the network to be ready um, to collect data in this way starting in July, but we aren't actually going to be asking for data um, until the end of fiscal 24. So fiscal 24 would be the first year um, where we would be looking for the data. So capturing the data from fiscal 24. Um, so the goal now is to be able to share what the reporting template will look like so that the network can get ready. Um, so we're not collecting historical data that may not align um, with the template or have been collected in the way um, that is needed through the template, um, but really to give the providers an opportunity to set their systems up so moving forward, they can collect data in this way. Um, does that make sense? The first year we'll be asking for is fiscal 24. Hey, Kristen, it's Laura. Everything you said, can you add that as a preamble to the template instruction so it's clear moving forward so when this goes out or is shared, people can read what you're saying and are clear on, you know, uh, I think it was Maria, your question that you're asking, the timing um, and, and the rationale for the timing? Yes, definitely. Maria, does that work for you? It does, yeah. I, I, I think I misunderstood this template and the purpose that it sounds like we won't have data, data from this template and for another several years. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, um, yes. and, and that we still have a challenge of, of, you know, at least, you know, historical data. So um, that's helpful. Um, I did think um, at least on the provider information that we should add a time period, uh, just so it's clear what time period is being reported um, as a as a standard. <laughs> yes, and that will certainly change um, as the, the years go on, but we will make sure that that is added so when the template goes out, it's very clear, um, both in the instructions and in the provider information. Mm -hmm. Kristen, this is Laura. I just, and I'd be curious to hear what providers on the call think, but I'm just thinking about that transition period and cost reports and having to kind of switch on a dime. Not that, I mean, we have to make the transition, but I'm just wondering if there are any issues with that transition period of time. Um, because providers are going to have to be able to report, um, presumably do their routine cost reports, and then this would ultimately become, the, I assume, the cost report, that this would be replacing the cost report the DDA requires. So I just want to make sure that we don't miss planning ahead for something in that kind of transition period. Um, so this is a, definitely a discussion and a topic that came up with the provider work group. Um, and so the template is designed to capture um, cost data for providers who are in both systems currently, um, or may make the transition from one system to another within the fiscal year that we're collecting the data. Um, and I know Robert has, has spoken a little bit, um, but providers who continue to um, provide services through PCIS2 would be required to submit the cost reports until um, they're made the fully made the transition. Um, and I can defer to, to Robert if he has any additional comments. I think, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Kristen. That's correct. Um, the cost reports are unique to the PCIS2 system and are required by law. However, uh, once providers have transitioned fully over, they would not be required to do the cost report. And so this, in essence, become becomes a replacement for that. But in the interim, as we're trying to collect that historical data to inform future, uh, you know, rebasing of the rates, um, um, the, the providers who are in P-size 2 will have to submit both. And uh, we could talk a little bit more about that internally to, you know, see if there's any way to reduce the administrative burden. But um, unfortunately, those <laughs> cost reports are required in that system. This is Donna. I would just really suggest that we make that as clear as possible in the instructions. I think it's going to be a 
a bit confusing, especially if you're into different systems or transitioning out of. Absolutely. So I guess everyone will eventually be in the LTSS system. And so at that point, that is when this becomes the new cost report. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's correct. But Robert, just for clarity, because actually you all, I was asking a different question, but this is a good discussion. Um, I guess I'm a little concerned about providers having to do both. And, um, you know, that's that's going to be a lot. Um, and I, I, so then that triggers another question, which is, um, I am assuming that these will not need third party attestation as the cost reports do. That's correct, Laura. Okay. Um, okay. I, uh, I guess maybe we'll have some further discussion about uh, what that's going to look like for providers being asked to do both. I was thinking that it was more of a transition in time, sort of a time-based transition as opposed to a systems-based transition. And I guess my question is, is there a reason that that can't happen? That this couldn't take the place of the required cost report you know, in terms of the PCIS2 system until everyone is, has made the transition and it's gathering the same information. All right, so the cost reports are required by law, so it, that right. would require a change in the legislation. Um, the, where these reports, I'm, I'm sorry, the GL data collection template is, is not mandatory However, we're encouraging all providers to fill it out because the more data we have, um, the better projections we can make uh, based on how the costs have changed since we last, um, you know, received the data from providers uh, from a few years ago. Right, but I does the and Robert, you probably have looked at that part of the statute more recently than I have in terms of what it specifies for the cost report? Because my question is, can this template take the place of the cost report until we make the full transition? Would that is there a scenario in which this would suffice for meeting that requirement? Understand? I'll take that back and I'll have a conversation with DCAR to see if there's any flexibility related to changing the actual tool to mirror what the GL collection tool looks like. So I'll certainly take that back and have a conversation with them. Great, thank you. Robert, Chris Parks. Just a quick question to clarify. So right now for FY23, you're looking for just the cost report. A provider has the option to fill out the GL data collection tool. But for FY24, is the GL collection tool gonna to be mandatory? Or did I hear you say no? So I would have to, it, it wouldn't be mandatory, but you know, uh, right now for folks who are billing in LTSS, what's mandatory are the audited financial statements. But we want, uh, you know, we had a discussion, I think it might have been late last year or earlier this year, Chris, and um, the feedback that we were receiving from you all is to be able to fill something out on, on an annual basis um, so that we don't get, you know, it, stuck in a situation where we're requesting data like two or three years, every two or three years, so that we can, you know, constantly get providers into a routine of providing data and providing it in a standardized way. So that's the ultimate goal. 
Gotcha. So for for twenty three, both the cost the cost reports required the geo data collection tools optional. Same thing for FY twenty four. Cost reports going to be required with the geo data collection tool being optional. If that's the case, then that puts us the first year that it's required when everybody's fully in will be FY twenty five, which means we're not going to have a batch of data till January of twenty six. So we'll make sure I'm, I'm I'm understanding it so I can you know people ask we'll make sure I can clarify. And just Chris, and that would be collecting data about FY24. Just to clarify, right? Yeah, the goal would be to have the provider network use this tool to collect data for fiscal 24, um, putting us or giving us the data in 25. Do you have confidence that you'll have enough participation if it's not mandatory? And again, I'm not advocating for more work for the providers, but I think that at some point, the sooner we can get our hands on that data, the better off we're going to be. Yes, we agree. Um, and so we're hopeful um you know that the RI, you know really can be a partner in working with the provider network you know talking about the importance of of getting the data um the more data that we collect and the you know better the the system gets at being able to complete the template and submit the data you know as robert said then we've got you know annual data to support the priorities um you know and the the data needed for moving forward and Chris, one of the roles of the advisory group when we talked um, last year was um, to um, provide support for um, issues like this data collection and encourage providers to participate in the process. So uh, the number of providers that participated in the feedback on the GL was low, that would not be sufficient um, to utilize this GL template for rate setting. We would need significantly more participation, and that's where we would look to the advisory group to help uh, encourage providers to participate. And can I just jump in and say, and we would certainly obviously, um, uh, you know, <laughs> urge our, all of our members to to complete it um i do think you know the the tension between wanting data quickly but also wanting to have a good process to put this in place and give providers adequate enough time to um make any changes to their ledgers that they have to make in order to complete this so i, I just want to say i appreciate the um the timeline of not necessarily rushing that because it is a big uh, deal for providers to to make this kind of shift in their accounting ledgers. I think that's exactly right, Laura. Um, I think what we want to do is strike a balance between um, getting that more robust data as soon as possible, but also making sure that it's actually achievable and we're not putting something out there on a, a timeline where it all, where it doesn't actually happen because providers aren't ready. Um, and as has been said already, I think that that's where you all can really help. Um, if there are barriers that you see to providers being able to adopt this, let us know. You've already let us know of something um, which has been helpful. And then, anything that you can do through your networks to help encourage um, participation is extremely helpful. So I, um, a little late to the game and really looking at this deeply, but I have to say, I, I really like the framework of it, that it uh, matches with the brick and it helps us to think of the, each of the components separately and have asked my team to look more carefully at it, but from first glance, I would say we could do this now. I mean, it's from first glance that there's, there's, you know, things get, this is how we collect the data. The only piece that I would say is under training, and I'd, I'd have to really think through this, um, is 
that if we are looking in the state of Maryland right now at a career pathway, at looking at DSPs who are of different levels, how can we break some of that out? So when people go through the training, so the training component, we can capture the training um, in the training component with the staffing and so on and so forth. But the, once a person, once a staff is credentialed, they get an increase of salary. And so for that credential. So I think the, on, the only piece that I would say is if there's a way for us to think about how we, um, how, how we break down like the number of DSP ones, twos and threes or whatever the credentialing ultimately, I mean, that was what the, the original proposal to DDA that they accepted was, was a career pathway of DSP one, two and three. But so I would think that that would be, and that's something, it, it does take a while in your system to do that. We had to go into not only our ADP system, but also into our other system to track that. That's the only thing that I would say, but I would, I would think that that's something for DDA's purposes, we might wanna have upfront so we know how many of each level are happening for um, in, in different providers. And Jennifer, if I can just jump in, I do think there are, um, you know, we talked about this with the data collection originally, which is that there were items that in hindsight, we now know there was a lack of clarity in which kind of bucket it went into. And, uh, you know, the one example is driver wages and salaries or, you know, um, DSP time in transportation. Some people attribute that to transportation in their ledger. Some people attribute that to wages and, and put everything in ERE. Um, and, you know, I don't think that all those things necessarily got caught initially, um, but the, you know, the original advisory group um, certainly had a lot of discussion about it. Um, so, I, I, so I think it's really good that there's this clarity, but I, I do think providers need, you know, that time to be able to set up a system so they don't have to go in and manually try to pull apart data um, to be able to complete it. So I, I just think that's a good idea that you're giving them a little time. Laura, do you have any sense of what percentage of your providers um, you're talking about? Is it two or three people? Is it, I mean, we do not have we don't have drivers um, and I, you know, a lot of residential providers wouldn't have drivers separately, I don't think. Um, people, organizations that do primarily or exclusively. So are we talking about a huge number of people who, um, I mean, mostly people I would think that have traditional day programs and center-based programs is who you're talking about, which has got a smaller end today than in the past. Right. I think I think they have, but I also think potentially CDS where someone is driving. I mean, I really need to think that through, but definitely, you know, the providers with um, day have programs. And, you know, when you think that the data was originally collected back in 14 um, and I don't know how many changes providers have made to their ledgers, but I suspect they don't make, you know, really radical changes uh along the way so i i think it is enough providers um based on the discussion in the tech work group that um and you know i know chris works with um, um different providers around some of these issues so I don't, chris i don't know if you have thoughts but I, I think it's more than a handful for sure i would absolutely agree with that i think every organization functions uh you know differently uh, depends on the center, depends on the situation. Uh, but again, I, I agree with Laura. I think the clarity is definitely needed. We missed that clarity with the overtime piece on the front end uh, when we did the original projections with JVGA. And I think you're going to see an impact from that. I think we make sure we get this straight coming out of the gate because, we, again, you've got multiple different scenarios. Might be an interesting quick survey of people who have licensed day programs to see um, to actually get some data on that, because you might be able to move on this quicker if that's uh, it, it, it might be it might be a smaller end 
is, is I know that a lot of people have changed their model of supports at this time and are doing um, community-based supports rather than center-based supports. I know that certainly here in Montgomery and Prince George's County, that's, that's true. So I, I think it would be a quick survey to people who are in, um, who have uh, center-based programs that are still operating transportation. I also know that a lot of families have said, I don't want my kid on a van with, you know, a bunch of other people. So families have really changed their model. So I think it's worth a, worth a quick ask. Yeah, just, I, and I'm sorry if I didn't make this clear, that was sort of one example, but I think there are other examples, as Chris said, like over time and uh, in terms of how providers, um, categorize them in their ledger. So I, I don't think it is only the driver issue. I mean, I appreciate the fact, it, yes, having data earlier would certainly be helpful. I mean, I, I agree about that, but I, I think um, it might be challenging since it's more than one issue. Hold well, on, I think. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, so, I think a lot of um, these issues and the clarity are kind of captured on our cost categories defined. Um, this really was the original um, kind of crosswalk that was used um, back when the first data was collected. Um, and we got a lot of feedback um, as, you know, from that first round. And then again, with vetting it with our provider work group to kind of address some of these issues. Um, Overtime was a, a big topic of discussion. Um, you know, we went back and forth with the group and consulted with Optimus. So there is more clarity on how overtime wages should be categorized on the template. Um, and then to, you know, help to address the consistency across the network, the goal really will to be to um, thoroughly vet those templates as they come in that first year to make sure that providers are doing it consistently. Um, so we do imagine that there will be some follow-up with providers, you know, and potentially having to move some costs, you know, to align to make sure the system is, you know, all consistent. Um, but I would really ask that, you know, you guys look at this cost categories defined, um, you know, let us know what's missing, let us know where you have questions, um, let us know where we can be more clear, because I do think that this is kind of the roadmap for how providers are going to capture those costs um, by the services. And, and I think to, to build on what you were just saying, Kristen, um, that can also be, if you see something in cost categories defined that's not how you or the providers you're familiar with currently have their books set up, that's great for us to know because um, then that speaks to kind of the, the discussion we were just having about um, the right speed to take this transition. So and any of that insight that you can provide us is definitely appreciated. Um, we have a lot of other topics today, so I do want to transition over to um, Optimus talking about our priorities, but this has all been really helpful discussion and dig into these documents some more and keep providing us feedback because we definitely um, Want to know what you think and what barriers there could be out there to getting this implemented. Um, so with that, Gen why Jennifer, don't... it's Chris Parks. Oh, go we... ahead. Two, two questions real quick before we bounce, and I know we got to go quick. Um, Kristen, can you go possibly go back to the introduction page real quick? Thank you. My one of my first questions is the in the overview of data section, the very last line, your submitted general ledger template is not required to reconcile with your audited financial statements. Can you tell me the thought behind that? And in the absence of that, because you've also got mixed funding for providers too. When I say mixed funding, I mean non-DD services embedded into their their financials. Can you tell me what the thought pattern behind that was? And, and again, if we feel comfortable that we're going to get you know, accurate, consistent data without that tie out. Um, yep. Yeah. So this was definitely a, a topic that came up in question um, as part of the provider work group. Um, so we, we talked with our partners at Optimus and we also consulted, you know, with the DDA um, and the ultimate decision was um, that it wouldn't be required. Um, and so, you know, Robert, I don't know if you want to jump in or, um, you know, if Chris or someone from the, the Optimus team wants to share some more details on how we came to that decision.
Um, so, Chris, I can just say that yeah, when we when we talked about it, um, the feedback that we got was that you know ideally um, they would match, um, but if there was a, an issue of timing in terms of when we needed the data and reconciling um, with the audited financial statements, you know we didn't want to hold up collecting the general ledger data. Um, you know, and also recognizing that we may be collecting data in a different way um, than you're seeing your audited financials. Okay, so thank you for answering that. I, I think one of the, the pieces that I see that and, and, you know, filling out the cost report for many years, I had multiple uh, funding sources. So you have a staff in one particular situation and your question could be, am I coding them to DDA or am I coding them to a traumatic brain injury program or another program? how do, do we make sure that the DDA piece is getting where it needs and something's not, you know, mixed up or missed in that particular case? That was, that was my, my thought on the, the tie out to the financials. Yes, and we recognize that there's often braided funding and we're only requesting, you know, the Medicaid piece for your DDA services. It can be harder to separate for providers at some point in time. I mean, you could have a group one to four and you've got three people funded DDA and you got one funded another source. And uh, I just think, and it goes back to, I think too, we can clearly define some of the, uh, the uh, items to exclude in the cost category description and just kind of clarify where things go. Uh, I, I personally, I think there's value in tying it out. Um, I think without it, you may get some hit or miss of, of what's included and what's not. Thank you though. I appreciate your feedback. And Chris, did you say you had a second question as well, or, or were those all of your questions? Uh, kind of tied together. It was the mixed funding piece of it. Uh, I just, again, I think the complexity, you're going to have billable, non billable time. You're going to have DDAs of funding source, potentially others that we got real clear instructions to the provider community to say, this is what our expectation is. Because I mean, ultimately, you're looking at tying the uh, uh, the cost categories back out, especially you know the the billable, non billable hours. That's why we're asking for them with the uh, the wage piece. So we want to make sure that we have the correct wages with the correct billable hours, and that there's consideration given to all the aspects that are actually being served at that point in time from that individual staff person. Okay, um, can we switch back over to the PowerPoint? Um, and I will turn it over to Optimus to um, talk more about some of our additional priority items and have some discussion about how we can approach them. And thanks, Jennifer. This is Leslie from Optimus. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, keep going. <laughs> Great. So we'll be talking about the fiscal year 25 rate priorities that we identified in the last meeting. Um, so next slide. Um, so based on the feedback from the last meeting, we compiled a list of current data sources um, that we have used or anticipate being able to draw from to help us evaluate the various rate components and um, priorities that we identified for the um, dehabilitation services. We've cataloged wage data, um, which we've had in the past. Um, we are currently looking at the updated BLS wage data on our end. Um, and then we have some employment first work group data that was shared to us. So thank you, Karen, for sharing that, um, that we're also looking through. Um, we have the 2017 rate setting cycle data um, that we can still lean on and uh, make updates to, which we have uh, already in the last cycle. Um, and then we're looking at getting past and current population and member data, the transportation data template from last cycle, and then we have the CPI, COLA increases, funding level increases, um, and then we are working with DDA to make sure that the training requirements are updated and accurate. So those are kind of, or those are the major data sources that we're looking to lean on to help us address some of the issues that we um, identified for this cycle. Um, 
Please note that the fee out was not included because we tried to list any data that would be relevant to be able to help us identify um, and address specific component adjustments. Um, the fiat doesn't contain the level of detail that we need to make any specific adjustments. It was a benchmark for total provider revenue, which we've looked at and it helped us identify where there may be any gaps or issues with providers revenue. Um, and so it's not listed here because it, it's not a very, it doesn't have the level of detail we need to address the issues identified. Um, oh, Leslie, can I just ask a question? When it says um, CPI and COLA increases, funding level increases, is that, I assume that's a look forward? Yes, um, it's all the legislation that's been passed and, and we're working with DDA to make sure that it gets incorporated appropriately into the um, rate model. So that's uh, taking into account for the, the rates. Yeah, I just when I you know when I look at 2007 and um, looking at kind of how old that data is, and then um, and and pre pre COVID, um, I just yeah don't know how helpful that data will be. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why um, this slide here is just taking an inventory of what we currently have to work with, um, and looking at. Um, we'll be discussing today and in the next meeting what kind of data we can collect to update some of this information. Um, for instance, the transportation data from last year is more updated data that we've applied to the rate model, um, but this is what we currently have in our uh, toolbox, essentially. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions on this slide? Okay, um, next slide, please. So uh, last meeting, we identified eight items we could be revisiting to impact the um, rehabilitation rates. To help our conversation be productive, we've subdivided those eight items over this meeting and the next because it's a lot of topics to get through. Um, the way that we subdivided them was pulling the components that we feel need additional discussion and or data collection from providers so we can get started on that now and make sure we have adequate time to get that information. Um, so that's the facility and program support component, um, talking about transportation costs, um, not available time, and then reviewing the rate structure. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll be discussing um, the BLS wages and training component and service adjustments next meeting because we have data that is more readily available for that. For instance, where I mentioned we're already looking at the updated May 2021 BLS wages. Um, so that's currently under analysis and we'll be sharing out what we find in April. Um, the training component, we're working with DDA to update, make sure that everything is appropriate and accurate still. And then for service adjustment, we're looking at um, pulling more recent years of um, closures and weather related um, issues for the day habilitation services. So all of the, this is under progress um, and we're able to access the readily available data. And so we'll be talking about this in the next meeting. Is everyone comfortable with that kind of subdivision? Perfect. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is just a summary slide. Again, um, the first five are what we'll be talking about in this meeting. The last three are what we'll be talking about in April. And then we have the current data sources listed and um, some data updates for the items in gray. Um, the for facility and program support, and we'll talk about this um, on the respective slides, but we anticipate being able to collect some data um, for the items three, four, and five, which is the more complex topics like transportation, on billable time, and structure changes. Um, we're hoping to use today as a discussion point to get some input from you all on how best to collect data and what information is out there for us to be able to address these issues. 
I apologize. Um, so yeah, we didn't want to put out a data template ahead of time on those topics because there's a lot of nuanced information here and it would be very, very helpful to get the provider input from that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So talking about facility and program support, um, here is currently what is being built into the rate model. Um, there will be, uh, I apologize, um, these percentages were a combination of what we were showing in the general ledgers when we had collected the data, um, as well as a slight increase done as a program change to, the, to account for some of the increased costs in transitioning to LTSS. There were some differentiation between the two to one and one to one and versus the small group and large group, and we parsed the data as best we could. But at the time, um, there was no clear distinction between the varying group sizes, so there were only patterns that we can cluster. Um, on the next slide, this is the data template that we're looking to request for fiscal year 22 data. Um, we want to keep it very simple because we know that there are challenges in parsing detailed historical data out. Um, but we're looking at just collecting fiscal year 22's total DSP wages, um, total dollars in program support, and total dollars in facility for the um, geographic differential areas and then the rest of state. And we want to keep it simple so that we can get as much information from providers as possible, um, from as many providers as possible. And then just like it's calculated in the uh, current rate model, we would just take the percentage um, from program support as relative to the wage and then facility relative to the wage. This is the current plan to collect the updated data for um, the facility and program support components. I'll pause here to get initial reactions and um, if we want to talk through any concerns or remarks. Leslie, just for clarification, when the region says DC or other, I'm sorry, do you mean um, the geographic differential in the rest of state? <clears throat> yes, um, we're trying to fit it all onto one slide, yeah. but uh, when we send out the template, there will be two separate templates, one for the geographic area and one for rest of state, um, so we can separate the two. Okay, thank you. Leslie, this is Maria. Um, on the um, DSP wages, would that just be the billable wages then, based on the, the definitions that are in this in the new GL collect, data collection template? So excluding transportation time um, that's not billed, excluding program support time, excluding you know ERE, you know paid time off, service costs. Um, training, <laughs> so all, all of the things that we've, we've talked about, you know, they're all interrelated. And, and how are you defining DSP wages? Because I think that's critical. Um, absolutely, that's a good question, and maybe that is good feedback to take. And we can add a second column to say billable versus non-billable DSP wages, um, and that way we can get both information. Would that be something that is reasonable? So you would just ask providers to allocate, you know, if seventy percent of their DSP wage is considered billable, that would just go in the billable column and, and some sort of allocation methodology. Is that what you were uh, considering? Yes. Okay. And then, because there's overlap, right? Like program support, there might be some non billable time that goes right now into program support. And so I think it's important to be clear so that each of the columns is mutually exclusive but captures all of the information that we need. Okay, that's super helpful feedback. Um, I'm going to make note of that really quick and then we'll add that to our template. Um, that is super helpful. Leslie, it's Chris Parks. Sure. Just to uh, follow up with what Maria was saying, I, I think there is value possibly in using the cost category descriptions that are going to be part of the GL data collection tool to you know accompany this request. That way we have some consistency in the providers and how they're putting the information in uh, maybe need to be tweaked a little bit but i think we start to move in that direction of this is what goes in these categories the categories we have here are the same ones that we're going to have in the geo data collection tool obviously there'll be more but i think consistency now and how we start to allocate the expenses would be uh, possibly be very helpful 
Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, so we'll work with um, Hilltop to make sure that the definitions and directions for this template will incorporate and align with what's in the general ledgers. Is there, are there any other initial reactions or comments to this? Awesome. Thank you so much. This was helpful to be able to um, think through what some of the challenges are. Um, Leslie, I'm sorry, you're faster yeah. than I am on the on the button. Um, no worries. <laughs> over, over time, would fall where where would you envision that falling? Um, I think I would need to uh, discuss that with um, the Hilltop team and make sure that it's in alignment. I don't want to misspeak right now, but I will make a note to uh, make sure we discuss where over time would fall. I, I'm going to defer to Maria, but I, I, I do remember there being a, that being kind of a, a pretty critical issue in terms of how it is captured and what it does, how it drives the rates. Right. And yeah, I think, again, alignment with the, the GL tool would be useful, but yeah, I think that's in program support. That's where these definitions, it, it's going to be critical to, you know, because I don't think providers are going to think, you know, they'll see wage and they'll put overtime in a wage category. And so the instructions are important or, um, or the detail um, so that you can make the adjustments to make sure it's consistent across providers. I am noting that uh, we definitely need to talk about overtime and then making sure that uh, we have billable versus non-billable and aligning with the general ledger's definitions. Leslie, it's Chris. Just another thought. I mean, we've got these categories in the GL uh, data collection tool. Is there value maybe in just using that tool as we finalize that draft, but with the expectation that they're only filling out these four tabs? Yeah, this is something that we definitely had considered. Um, what we're trying to balance is that um, we do not want to burden providers with um, providing a ton of detail in a short turnaround time. If we're hoping to collect this data for fiscal year 22 and using it to impact the rates for this cycle, um, we are trying to, again, strike that balance of asking for information but not having um, extreme detail like extremely parsed out detailed information um, because the components are just built on that relativity. Um, I, I agree with you all that it's important to make sure we understand what the denominator is and it's consistent. Um, but essentially we are looking at total dollars for each cost category right now. I just think we need to make sure and try to ensure that the request gives us the the most accurate data we can uh, so that it actually is useful. Yes, and I completely agree with that. And um, that's why your and all of your feedback has been so helpful to make sure that we very clearly define what dollars should go under each bucket. Um, but we don't want to um, unnecessarily burden providers with a short turnaround time on this to um parse out the dollar amounts and we want to look at total global dollars and i may have missed it i apologize what was the turnaround time you were looking for um so we're hoping to share this out uh in the next week or so to you all to be able to review and make sure that we hit all of the comments and feedback that um you all have shared and then um similar to last year, except with a little more lead time, sending it out to the provider community um, and collecting the data to be analyzed by May, I believe. And um, this needs to all be discussed and approved with the DDA team. So that is the rough timeline that we're looking at um, currently. That seems like a really tight timeline, doesn't it? Um, and so that's why it's still up for discussion, absolutely. Um, and also just why we wanted to get this in front of you now so we can start talking about that, um, making the adjustments and getting um, the template looked, vetted through.
I mean, I think probably one of the things we should probably discuss is what we think the minimum amount of time providers really would need to get this done, you know, whether it's six weeks, eight weeks, or whatever. And then based on when you get the approval to put it out, it would be from that timeline. What do you, I mean, Chris, you're working with other providers as well. How long do you think it would take to turn around the data? I mean, no, there's a whole lot going on. I mean, I know. You know, uh, I mean, it's going to depend on the level of detail that we actually request, and, and it's going to depend on. E I mean, each provider could be very different. I, I would think that request goes out next week. That you at least forty-five days, thirty to forty-five days, where you could even. I think anything shorter than that's going to be a heavy, heavy pull, and even that's probably going to be a heavy pull. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, six weeks. Donna, I, I, the larger I, providers. Donna, I think the question about um, timing is a good one. Um, since we have not determined what the final data request is, um, mm -hmm. and we have a number of topics we want to cover in today's meeting, I'm going to suggest um, we hold on this and we keep rolling. Um, and um, that way, uh, we'll have uh, all of the items out on the table and we can look at it in its entirety if the group is okay with that. Steve, it's Chris. I, I, I mean, it certainly can't hurt. Um, I, I think, you know, again, there's value maybe in looking at the finalization of this data collection piece as part of a subgroup. And if, and if you'd be willing, I know uh, no commitment to be able to attend each one, but I think there may be value in, in diving down a little bit on this before we, we launch it all out. Some of these questions we're not going to be able to answer in, in the you know the time frame that suits the the goals i think to uh to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish i think that makes perfect sense and as um jennifer talked in um the beginning of the meeting uh as long as um the subgroups work within the constraints um, that the uh, ag provided um and um, we can build a process to take that feedback i think it makes perfect sense um as leslie said the feedback is um, very well Welcome and very helpful. Um, okay, so just in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next topic. But um, thank you again for all your feedback and we'll take this back and update the template and share it out with the group, so. Uh, next slide, please. So now we want to talk about the transportation methodology. Um, the current methodology where transportation costs are compared against wages to arrive at the component um, is used across multiple services, inherently allocates the cost based on DSP hours. Um, last year, Max introduced a proposal to adjust the methodology, which was discussed in an ad hoc September meeting. This proposal was to reallocate the transportation costs in a budget neutral way by the number of participants rather than the aggregated DSP hours. So the two charts on the slide are showing the distribution of hours for each of the settings. Um, on the left is the based on the DSP hours. On the right is the distribution of the, based on the number of participants. Um, and the numbers on the right were pulled on the DDA utilization expectations. So just showing that um, the distribution of DSP hours for two to one, one to one day, small and large group look very different um, if we distribute based on billable time or DSP hours versus the number of participants in each um, group category. Um, so the next slide, please. The reason why we're bringing this up is um, we had shared that detailed and technical um, analysis that was done last September and um, that was shared out last week. But what we've noticed is the current alternative based on the DDA utilization numbers would shift dollars out of the two to one, one to one um, rates 
and into the smaller group and large group rate with a larger increase going into large group. Um, so with this proposal, as we understand it, it's intended to shift those dollars between services because we want to remain budget neutral. The question is um, just whether or not it's appropriate to do so. Um, and we want to keep this discussion open. Um, and we're not trying to debate numbers today, but rather the process. So how can we collect data in a meaningful way to help us evaluate the methodologies? Um, and then can we come up with, as a group, a reasonable data collection template to share with the broader provider community in order to visit these two different methodologies? This is Liz, Oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to ask, I didn't see the appendix. Um, I'm not sure in, in the attachment, so I might have missed it. I, I'm not sure exactly what that um, is referring to, but um, I think what this proposal was, um, if I'm remembering from, from last fall, was that we were hearing from providers of large groups that, you know, it's not necessarily uh, you know, they, they take more time to transport individuals because they have to pick up, you know, seven, you know, 10 people, um, you know, to get them to the day center versus, um, you know, a one to one, and that's not billable time and therefore, you know, a more equitable dis distribution um, of the transportation component, which is more of a, an individualized um, type of um, service is um, is distributed based on the participant. So that was, I think, um, the logic behind shifting from, you know, these the, the one to one and two to one, you know, where you've got two DSPs, but you only got one person you have to transport around versus seven, seven or, or, or 10 in a, in a large group. Um, so that is my recollection. But, you know, um, you know I, I don't know that I have an opinion other than we want to make sure that the distribution and allocation of transportation is fair and equitable. And, um, you know, one, one other thought is to add transportation to the data requests that you were looking to do for program support and, and facility to um, maybe get a better sense of how, you know, providers might allocate their transportation costs, um, both the time that a DSP is having to spend on transportation, um, you know, as non-billable time, um, as well as, you know, the, the cost of vehicles and, and drivers and um, those sorts of uh, components. So um, it, that might be helpful to just revisit um, the transportation component along with some of these other components. Yeah, and last year we had sent out a collection template for the transportation costs specifically, um, and it resulted in that increase to the rates uh, to the transportation component. Um, and so the question today, um, and thank you so much for resummarizing what your intention was with that. Um, I think it aligns with what we are interpreting are interpreting as well, um, which is that uh, if we are to um, change our distribution model to participant space, that it would be moving dollars out of these two to one and one to one and into the large group, because as you had mentioned, um, the, that you're hearing provider feedback um, say that large group costs more transportation. Um, and so I, I guess the question to pose now is what kind of additional data um, can we collect to get to that information that we didn't collect in last year's cycle? I don't, I don't know if Maria or others have an answer to that question, but I just want to um, say, you know, this was a, this was a long conversation and I feel like there were, there was feedback that Max gave that, um, you know, was, was, uh, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say it, but rejected for lack of a better term. Um, and I feel like, now that we're having this discussion again, it would might be helpful for um, at least for Max to uh, kind of go back and look at that again and then give you feedback. It's a little hard to do it sort of in the moment, given that that discussion isn't 
fresh. And I think that I feel like with transportation and, um, you know, the acuity discussion that we've had that it's, I, I feel like the, um, kind of the, the avenue we've gone down is, uh, leaves us with kind of big swings in adequacy of funding, either, you know, really overfunding or underfunding as opposed to really tying the rate a little more closely to the actual needs of someone. And I know, I mean, this discussion goes back at least a few years to before the RAG, you know, that you have transportation <clears throat> costs that, you know, may range from a Metro pass to, you know, far more based on this, you know, the transportation needs of someone. Um, and so uh, I guess I would just like to have, you know, a little bit of time. Others may be able to respond in the moment, but um, to kind of go back and think about that. And, and I just want to say again, I think I'm not sure that the approach we're taking really solves the bigger problem. Um, so anyway, that's it. Um, this is Karen, not necessary for me to say this, but I agree 100% with Laura. Um, I, I just really feel like even the slide before that I have to go back and do some, I gotta do some work on this to figure out what my feedback would be. So if, if we could have a little time to do that, then I think we could um, get some responses to it. But on the fly like this, I can't, you know, I'm sorry, I, you know, but I, I, I cannot respond intelligently. <laughs> So I prefer to have a chance to really review some of this with, with my team um, and, and then get back with you guys if possible. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we don't expect to solve all these problems today. These are very complicated conversations that have been happening over a long period of time. Um, this is really just getting us started in having these discussions. And that's why we wanted to start it early in this meeting specifically. Um, and um, just wanting to make sure that we all understand kind of the premise of what we're looking to discuss and what the goals are. Um, and so some things to just think about as um, we take it back and, and um, you know, look at all the historical and conversations we've had and, and having those discussions with your um, provider community is, is what kind of data we would look to collect in addition to what we collected last year. Um, and um, looking at the process of which we can review the methodology. Um, so it sounds like what we want to do is table this conversation through right now until you're able to go back and look at old conversations and look at what we've discussed in the past um, and then be able to submit the feedback to DDA. Is that um, reasonable? So, so why, why don't we do this? Let me know if everyone just seems to make sense. Why don't we continue through kind of these introductions to each of the issues? If folks have initial thoughts, We'd love to hear them, but then obviously with the understanding that it's likely going to take more more time and thought, and you'll likely have additional feedback later. But I think it will be useful to kind of go through this, get any initial impressions, and then um, you can take that back and provide us with any additional feedback that you uh, think of. All right, Leslie, do we want to go on to the next um, item? Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and, and then one more slide, please. Perfect. Um, so the next slides will be talking around the methodological process, um, considerations for non-billable time. Um, just a brief introduction to the topic. There is billable time for every DSP providing service where providers can bill for the service rendered. Um, however, DSPs also have that non-billable time that we've talked about. The intent for the rate 
is that the billable time should provide revenue to account for both billable and non-billable costs. Um, and then as a fiscal year 25 priority, the topic for consideration is the process by which we account for those non-billable costs in the rate. So currently there's no explicit adjustment to account for non-billable time, um, but the wage component, the wage and components are intended to cover both billable and non-billable costs. Um, an alternative proposal would be to pull the non-billable costs out of the wages and components and then add an additional adjustment that explicitly addresses the non-billable costs. Um, next slide, please. So some things to consider as we take back and discuss with our colleagues is um, the data we currently have does not have this information split by billable and non-billable wages. Um, we've already heard that feedback today several times that you know it's in program support, there's uh, non-billable costs in transportation, there's a lot of places where that non-billable cost is accounted for currently. Um, and so Additionally, the wage selections made by DDA as a basis were considerably higher than the average wage survey data that we received from the provider community initially um, to help account for those additional non-billable costs. So in order to make this adjustment where we pull the non-billable out of the, um, the implicit build-in in the rate model, um, and make an explicit adjustment, we would need to um, adjust the wages appropriately um, to make sure that we're not double counting or over accounting for those um, adjustments that were made. So any changes to the methodology would imply a broader change across services for consistency in the rate model. Next slide. Leslie, I'm sorry, can you just go back to that last slide for a second? So does that mean that if it was in terms of wage, if that was pulled out, that it would go into program support? And um, that's what we would like to discuss with y'all and, and like what your initial thoughts on that are. We don't have um, you know, we wanted this to be a collaborative effort because it's a very nuanced topic. Um, and so we don't want to make any assumptions on where the dollar should go, um, how to pull it out, what the proportion of non-billable time is. Um, we want to be able to figure out a way to collect that data in order to be able to let the data speak for itself. Um, and so that's where we we're leaning on your expertise to help us figure out um, what's the best way we can parse out that non-billable time in each of the components and the wages? Um, what data we can collect to be able to view or to get that kind of detail um, and, and see where that data informs us um, would be appropriate to allocate that non-billable um, costs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that again is something that probably needs a little time to think that through, but I just want to make sure I understood where you're going. Thanks. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, so thank you for letting me clarify that. And, and as a follow up, I guess, Leslie, to that, um, sure. are you then thinking this would change the definitions in the GL data collection tool that we just talked about? So that rather than have the providers split their wage by billable, non-billable time and allocate the non-billable time into ERE, transportation, program support, training, that they would allocate it differently than the instructions. I'm trying to understand what maybe you're thinking here and how that Im <laughs> impacts all the data collection that we've just talked about. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yes. We have to take all that big picture um, kind of downstream impacts into consideration where this is not a uh, the proposal that I had mentioned is not any kind of set in stone proposal it's something to consider for the group if that's the direction we want to go in do we want to continue to build um, into the wages and the various components um, the uh, accounting for that non-billable time or do we want to 
explore the avenue of pulling out the non billable time and making an explicit adjustment. Um, again, we do not want to make any kind of decision um, on that. We want to open that up for discussion um, with DDA, with the provider community, and make sure that everybody um, has input on it before trying to collect data and go down that avenue. Um, and so as you go back and think about this um, and think about what the impacts to the general ledger collection data is and, and all those other um, kind of downstream impacts, um, it would be helpful to get that kind of insight into um, which processes you think would be helpful for us to explore. And Maria, we need to move forward on the GL template. So while in a perfect world, we would be able to delay um, because um, we need to move forward on the GL template and we need that uh, time as Chris has um, mentioned in the past to get the providers uh, being able to do that going forward. Um, at some point, we're gonna have to drive a stake in the sand and say, these are the definitions for the GL template. Uh, and this is additional data that we are collecting to inform uh, adjustments to the methodology. Yeah, my, my concern is that we, we want to make sure we have consistent, accurate information and you know how, how we do it, I think, is less important than making sure that the instructions in the GL template and the data that we're collecting are clear. So I think there's lots of different options, but I, I would think our goal is to make sure that we have clear, consistent data <laughs> to, to build, the, you know, build our methodology off of. And, and this billable, non-billable time has been, I think, quite confusing um, to, to providers, and, and it's still confusing, I think, on the on the templates themselves, um, which then creates a risk for inaccurate rates and assumptions ultimately. So. Um, so I think it's important to make sure that the definitions are are consistent and tied together. And if we're going to switch that definition, I, I don't I don't necessarily have an opinion. My, my opinion is what's easiest and best and clearest for the providers to make sure we get accurate data. I, I just want to add um, that nobody wants this done faster and and well than me um but that kind of that that concept of we've got it we've got to move forward is how we are now in year nine every step along the way we've sort of rushed to get something done and then it, it is only added time so I, believe me i i want this done quickly but we really have to make sure <clears throat> we take the time to get it right <clears throat> and consistent um, so that we don't add time on at the um, back end. We certainly hear that. I mean, part of this is that we're confined to this yearly cycle where we are up against deadlines. Um, you know, by late summer, this stuff has to be, the the rate cycle for 25 has to be completed. So um, that ends up being a constraint that sort of propagates forward and and determines how much time we have to discuss each of these individual topics. And some of these, um, maybe we don't solve this cycle. Um, we're not saying that all of this has to be tackled immediately. Um, we're trying to lay out options and hopefully arrive at some consensus about where the um, the best efforts of this group can be applied. So with that, we can move on, I suppose. Yeah, I just wanted to check in if there are, I know it's a lot of information and we all are looking to process this um, and give feedback, but are there any other initial thoughts on billable time or billable versus non-billable time before we move on? Okay, um, we definitely look forward to your feedback on this once we've all had time to process and think about this a little more. Um, okay, the next uh, slide, please. Um, one more. 
Um, sorry, one more slide. <laughs> Great, thank you. So the last kind of topic that we want to talk through today is the structure changes. Um, we want to look through at the method methodological process considerations with regards to potential alternatives. And again, these are not um, any alternatives where we're proposing this changes this cycle or, or anything like that. It's more just food for thought so that we can have a starting point for these kinds of conversations. Um, so for day habilitation, um, we have four specific services that can be built under LTSS. We have the two to one, one to one, small group um, of two to five individuals, large group for six to 10. Um, we've heard feedback in the past around considering changes to the structure um, and had briefly discussed this last cycle. A, an alternative, um, potential alternative structure would be to adjust the group sizes within each service. Um, and potentially adding more services. So if there are other alternatives that this group would like to discuss, we have um, the opportunity in this, um, like to talk through it. Um, I know just, again, there's been tons of conversations in the past. So just a really quick recap of the different um, proposals we've had around this. Um, we've had, one thing that we discussed last year was to separate the rates for the exact number of individuals. So having the rate for two, three, four, five, all the way to 10 people. Um, we've heard that that would be administratively burdensome. And so we did not explore that avenue last cycle. Um, we also discussed some of the limitations of having rates that represent a range of individuals. Um, for example, it can cost more to serve four individuals than it would to serve two. Um, but it may not cost exactly twice as much. Um, so by having one rate that encompasses the two to five individuals um, billing per person, the provider would get twice the revenue for serving four people as it would for serving two. Um, another way of saying this is that the average expected cost for the average group size is intended to be covered by the rate. Um, we've had extensive conversation around fixed and variable cost components. Um, currently, the model is to take the average of those six and variable costs and assign one rate to a group. Um, and I know that we've had lots of conversations around whether it's adequate, um, if the process is appropriate. Um, and so the solution that has been proposed in the past is to propose an alternate structure, alternative structure. Um, and so maybe there is a way somewhere between having one rate for every group size, discrete rates, versus the large um, or versus the range of sizes that we have now. I and mean, so that's what we wanted to discuss today is um, any reactions to an alternative structure. Leslie, when you say alternative structure, are you suggesting that changing the group size or what, I guess, can you elaborate on what that means in your mind? Yeah, so um, if we're looking to get more detailed in accounting for those um, variable costs between the group size, is there a structure that would strike the balance between not being too administratively burdensome versus also allowing um, the rates to be more flexible for those sizes? For instance, um, could we do two to two to three, three to four, and have groups of sizes of two? Do we maintain the same group size but look at um, accounting for costs in a different way? There's a lot of different alternatives that, again, we want to make this a collaborative process. We don't want to dictate or, you know, um, suggest ways to do that without your input, since you are the experts on the structures. Uh, can I just say, I feel like this um, gets, starts overlapping with, um, the discussions we've had in the past about acuity because you know when you think about doing it only by group size you know probably the biggest factor is what the staffing level needs to be and that 
is partially dictated by group size, but also partially dictated by <clears throat> acuity or the support needs of people. So I think it's difficult to um, only drive the rate um, by group size. So that's why it, it, it would be a little challenging for me to respond in the moment about that. You don't yeah. think, Laura, that it, it that a group size and acuity go hand in hand, like the the one on one. I mean, I one of my questions would be on the policy side for DDA, who's trying to increase people's. I mean, we call it a person centered plan, so I would think that doing something in a group of six to ten people might be inconsistent with what the requirements of a person-centered plan would be. So I, I, I wonder if, if you, you do the acuity, the acuity piece comes out by the size with the two to one, one to one, or two to five. And does it make sense to even have a one to, one to three and then a three to five? So I think when you look at one to one and two to one, you know, clearly that factors in acuity. But I think the discussion, all the, the premise of this was always that group size um was kind of a, a proxy, I think, for acuity. But I don't I don't know that um I don't think that's one hundred percent the case. I mean, I think about sports that people get and um, you know, um, you know, somebody may need one to one, but then they're in a group of a certain size, um, or you may need to have, you know, one staff for two people versus one staff for four or five people, um, but they could still potentially be somewhere in a group size that doesn't, you know, if the assumption is just really, you know, roughly, if the assumption is one staff per group, let's say group A and B, leave group C off, um, you know, you might have people that go out in a, um, I mean, if you took just for conversation purposes, group A, B, and C, and you said it was, uh, it's, uh, you know, two through four, five through seven, and eight through 10, you could have, you know, a group of three or four or five where the staffing levels are similar or different based on the needs of somebody in the group or a few people in that group. So that's why I just think, <clears throat> it's tough to only have it driven by group size. The other thing is that comes into play is when you're supporting um, individuals with very significant needs, mm -hmm. it depends on where you are and what you're doing in terms of that level of support if you truly make it person-centered. Um, so it is kind of hard to wrap your head around exactly what's on the screen right now and how that would play out. I mean, truly person-centered is depending on what support you're providing, where you're providing it. Um, I think of how we, you know, at our center, we support a lot of folks with very significant needs, a lot of folks in wheelchairs, and we may have in a certain area where it can be a one to three ratio, but if they're going to go out and, um, participate in something even educational, I know I'm going to need another staff with that group um, for that particular activity. So I'm not really sure. So wouldn't you just change what the funding level is when you change the kind of service that's being provided? Right? Isn't it 15 minute increments? So if they're in the center together that you would you would document that they're 
in, in the small group and then when they were going out that you would document that they were the one-to-one -one because that's what they needed. So doesn't that meet that need? Well, in that particular example, it wouldn't even be a one-to-one, -one, it would be a two to three. And, um, you know, it just depends on their schedule for that week and where they're going. If you were to do that, I mean, agencies have already talked about that right now with the two to five and the six to 10, that on the day they've added a person to the group, which is now a two to six, you know, they have to go in and remember to change the group size. Mm -hmm. Or if in the morning they're out with the two to six and they come back and it's a two to five, they got to remember to change that. And that was part of this whole discussion of how that came about, I think. So um, I don't have an answer, just basically conversation and trying to play some of that through what how my agency is, as well as some of the other agencies are that I'm familiar with, that really do support a variety of people with a variety of needs, depending on the setting they're in. We are, what we have seen in other states uh, is an incremental approach makes sense. It allows you to make progress and keep moving forward. So we agree with the idea of incorporating an acuity adjustment, but sometime in the future, um, and that we would use an adaptation like this as a proxy to continue to fine tune the rates. So um, we would see this as an opportunity to add some granularity to the rate setting to address concerns raised by the providers and also continue to move us forward in the time frame that we have available to us as Caleb mentioned, and then we could address acuity in the future. I just need to say something um, not related to self, to uh, JHAB, but community development especially. Self-direction at this time has no way to share staff with anyone. So when you have someone who has a, a low acuity, they're automatically put into one to four uh, funding right now. And they can't hire a quarter of a staff or a half of a staff. So that needs to be looked at. But it also seems like in that it needs to be not so much, uh, yes, acuity counts, but when you're talking about going out in the community, it's like, do I want to do something with 10 people? It does need to be person-centered. It needs to be, what is the activity on? If someone wants to, learn to become a horse trainer and wants to go spend time in a horse farm, that's really individualized or they're volunteering at their church during the day as a community activity. It doesn't matter what their acuity level is, it matters what it is they want to do with their time and, and, and who is going with them. It shouldn't be one to four, it should be one to one in that case for their individual activity. And I'm sure we all agree with that, but in self-direction, we have a problem when it's just whether they have a behavior um, plan or a B, uh, an HRST score of over four that they get a one to four, a one to one. So that's, we don't have the same issues you guys do and we're not as concerned about what the actual rate is. We just wanna be in the right rate category. So thank you. Steve, it's Chris. I uh, just want to say thank you. It's it's fantastic to hear that acuity is on the table at some point in the future. Uh, I, I think the lack of it in the current situation has driven us to try and come up with solutions that if we had had it in the front end, uh, I think we may not be dealing with. I think to Donna's point, the administrative burden of tracking and billing uh, when you're bouncing between group sizes is certainly uh, a significant challenge. Uh, so if we end up in that pattern where we're trying to address different group sizes, uh, to Karen's point, it's got to go back to the actual staffing that's going on. And it needs to be kind of tiered so that there's not that constant movement. There's a couple staffing ratios that providers are serving you know, the bulk of the people in. And we make sure we don't put the fringe of that group size right in the middle of that it needs to kind of match that structure so that we can minimize that administrative burden of bouncing back and forth between uh, the different group sizes from a billing perspective. 
Yeah, so it's, it's really a hard balance to strike. Um, we want to make sure that we try to be as um, appropriate as the appropriate setting and costs as possible accounted for without having, um, you know, that discrete um, billing that is so complex for the provider community. Um, and so we really appreciate all of the conversation that we've had around that. Um, are there any other additional comments? They know that we're running up against time right now. Um, and I, um, we really do look forward to any additional feedback that you can give us uh, once you have that chance to process all this information that was shared today. Okay, um, if there aren't any additional um, initial thoughts, then um, like I said, we do look forward to that feedback once everyone has a chance to process. Um, I knew that we threw a lot of information at you today, and so thank you so much for the engaging conversation um, and uh, thoughts for us to take back and consider. I'm going to pass it back over to um, the state to wrap up our meeting. Thank you, Leslie, and uh, thank you all for your thoughtful comments. Uh, before we move on to next steps and adjournment, does anyone have any walk-on items to discuss? Robert, it's it's Chris. Uh, clarification <clears throat> on the uh, memo from MDH uh, from Tuesday, the Medicaid check-in. Uh, I was hoping maybe you could clarify, obviously, uh, everybody's going to be going through that process right now, and then the uh, Family supports waiver and community supports waiver uh, already in place is that if an individual is found uh, ineligible for Medicaid, that services stop immediately. Will that be the intention for the community pathways waiver? So, Chris, if you don't mind, I'll take those two items back to the federal programs team and then we'll send out a response to this group uh, based on your questions. Thank you for Perfect. that. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer to close this out. All right, thanks everyone. Um, as I think we all said, we know this was a, a lot of information today. One thing I'm thinking about as we proceed forward is it seems like whatever direction we go with these items, it would probably be most helpful to think about how we can streamline the data requests um, as much as possible. So that, that's something I'm thinking about and that we'll take back and talk about internally, um, to kind of have the deliverable be one, one data request that doesn't feel so overwhelming as all of these separate items here. Um, but that being said, um, our next meeting, um, we look forward to talking with you again on April 13th from 1230 to 230. And just a note that is a slight change in the usual meeting time. Um, members of the public who would like to observe the meetings can register through the DVA training calendar at Constant Contact events. Um, register once and get reminders for each meeting via GoToMeeting. Um, meeting connection links will be sent one day and one hour prior to the meeting. Meeting minutes will be made available following the meeting. Um, if you have any questions regarding registration or would like to request accommodations, um, please contact Dr. Small. Uh, if we can move along in the slides, could we get to the calendar? That would be great. All right, I think that's the right slide. Um, so we have meetings on May 18th, June 22nd, July 20th, and August 10th. Um, all meeting materials will be made available through the designated DBA website for AR RAG. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Oh, there are all the meeting dates and times for everyone. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, all of them, as I said, all the meeting materials will be made available on the DDA website. And thank you again for attending, and we look forward to continuing this.
this discussion um, in the interim, please um, do send us feedback on all the materials shared today, things that you're thinking as you have time to um, mull it over some more and talk about it with others. And we'll talk more next month. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks all. Yeah. Thank you to the secretary for joining us.